Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Biden Numbers. I will prepare you up front. This is going to be a shorter than usual episode, not one of those big, bloated, sprawling, three hour long epics that you're used to. I know it's a shame because we haven't done a show for a while, but uh, Duncan's got shit to do in his lockdown in LA, shit to do with Flashpoint. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to be bringing you another episode probably early next week to yes. make up for it. And that will be a sprawling bloated nightmare but we're going to go for about 90 minutes here and um, we'll try and get through as much of the news as we can so first shout out has to go obviously to the sponsor of the podcast dot com they're an esports betting platform they're fucking great they do memes like everyone does these days as well uh, you can go check them out on twitter there it'll help support the show you can go place bets in a safe ethical environment and you actually get your winnings from them so it's all good uh, they're a great sponsor to have right then duncan let's start with some pleasantries uh how's lockdown going for you are you are you climbing the walls have you gone insane yet your twitter account suggests that you might have no i am actually <laughs> it hasn't really affected me much at all i mean luckily i do have the excuse that almost every single day of the week i go and do a flashpoint for like nine hours or something so to me i've got the ultimate distraction like i don't really notice all the rest of that shit because like to be fair i'm actually tired when i come home each day so it's only when i have a day like today like in theory a day off that i actually start to realize there is fucking nothing you can do yeah, I've, I've been having a real tough time, man. Like, um, I, I've hit that point now where I'm not, I wouldn't even describe me really as a sociable person. I think it's quite clear that I loathe humanity and everything it has accomplished up until this point. But um, I haven't, I, mate, it's like old boy, the fucking movie. I've started to carve fucking, you know, numbers into my fucking hand. Because... Problem is, it is different when, like, the key thing is, everyone, like, because I know everyone kept making that meme, like, which obviously was so unoriginal, like, <laughs> I was a nerd and an introvert anyway. <laughs> Lockdown, that's like my everyday life. It's like, yeah, but the part that you've missed with that, even though obviously we get, all get the joke, is it's very different to be an introvert and choose when you meet people and do social yeah. things. When you have no choice, that's the whole reason why in prison they put you in fucking solitary and everyone goes mental. Like, the whole point is when the choice is taken away from you, that's when you feel powerless. Of course. Yes. So uh, it, it, it's been weird. I, you know, I've, I've been streaming a lot. I've been streaming the Flashpoint games. I've been a, a partnered streamer for that, essentially. They let me have permission to to show the broadcast. So I've been watching the games. I haven't been watching, actually, what you guys have done. I've watched some of the shoulder content. It's been fun. Um, but, you know, I, I, I realized from that, like, there's 2,000 people just sat there because you know, people are losing their fucking minds. <laughs> like, there's no one, you can't go out and talk to people. You know, I haven't been to my local bar in six weeks. It's ridiculous. You know, it's like, and, and we haven't even got the big wave yet out here. All right. So that's come. Yeah, like we've had, we've had like a thousand cases, like 1,500 cases, 10 deaths. You know, it's like, it hasn't really hit us full force yet. So I've got that to look forward to um but anyway fuck that like let's let's keep the covid talk down to a minimum and let's talk about some counter-strike stuff first of all let's talk a little bit about one of the roster changes that has affected flashpoint and it is loosely linked to covid and coronavirus and all of that nonsense that's going on in the world right now um chaos obviously they were one of the teams that were kind of a bit of a surprise package in the early days uh of the flashpoint league in particular because smuya was feeling it he was playing particularly well he added a lot of firepower to the roster unfortunately he was out there and he was in between visas um and what's happened is because the, the american uh, government has decided to essentially lock down all visa processing everyone's had to return home um if able and now he doesn't have a valid visa to play for the organization anymore so that they were forced to use a stand-in for a few games and now it's officially been announced that because we don't know when this fucking lockdown is going to end they've just essentially terminated his contract by mutual agreement because he can no longer fulfill his contractual obligations to pay play in the u.s uh so once again this insane twisting nightmare that is smoothie's career i mean like it's getting to the stage now where i've been through some shit lately whenever i want to feel good about myself i just think about what's happened to smoothie ever since he left big um it, it is it is insane and and I, and I was going to ask you as somebody that's kind of was out there and has worked on the league that he was playing in I, I do have a kind of a gut feeling that there's maybe something between the lines there as well that maybe they didn't really have to cut him from the roster but they probably thought fuck it actually like if he's not going to play for months 
Well, you know, it's not that great that we keep it. Yeah, that's, I'm them. not sure on that one, actually, because mm. like I do notice, by the way, it's only within the last few days that you've even seen the first inklings of esports companies cutting payroll and staff, etc., because of obviously like they have low liquidity and everyone's in deep shit because of all the COVID stuff and no one knows when it ends. So I will yeah. say I've only just noticed that kicking in generally in the scenes. I don't know if that's connected to this, like they just didn't want to pay his salary because... They could, they're going to, I mean, Chaos isn't exactly a super famous org that everyone knows. They're, mm. they're fairly small. In fact, this team's one of the most best known, probably. So, what I would say is, I totally get why they wouldn't use them anymore because obviously it's an NA org. And in theory, I mean, there aren't any fucking tournaments to play in anyway. So, it doesn't matter in that regard. But it, it is rough because he was clearly the best player on the team. And I think also, the, the reason why it's hard to tell if there was actually any issues internally in the team is because. It's hard to tell whether Steel and Smoothie were like joking that they don't like each other. Because let's be real, as people, yeah. I don't feel like those two personalities would get along that well. I feel like there'd be Not an obvious, all. like, they're, they're, like they're, if put it this way, in terms of levels of seriousness, for example, like Steel is night and day compared to Smoothie. So my problem with that is in public, they bantered that they didn't like each other or like joked about each other being shit. And then you have to add in, they are both basically, as you implied in your intro, like, like they're, they're basically playing together out of happenstance. It's not like that was their, their first choice. Like, Smoothie mm. is in a fucked up situation because of what he's done with Big and what he's done with his career in Europe. And obviously, Steel has to continually work with whoever is just willing to not play at majors. So I do feel as though they were already in something of a contrived, quite strange relationship as it is. So I doubt this helped put out with Like, I would give you maybe like a 10, 20% chance maybe that this is also just a convenient way to cut him. Yeah, well, we had um, we actually had Steel on the show for a bit while they were waiting. Right. I think it was the day there was a uh, there was the de delayed games, um, and it was about a two hour hiatus between the matches starting uh, from when they were scheduled. Yes. So he jumped on he jumped on the No Flashpoint Club and was sat there talking. And I and I said to him like, um, "Are you missing Smoothie at the moment?" And he went, huh. and he just sort of like <laughs> moved away from the question. Oh, so you did quickly. imply that there was maybe something there because yeah, obviously that's then... right, easy to just be magnanimous if you don't have to play with him anymore. Yeah, ex exactly. And 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 oh, then yeah. he, he 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 quickly moved on to talking uh, about the standing, um, which of course is a voltage um, being being a very good pickup for them, and uh, just sort of rushed past it. And then of course the literally i think it was like 24 hours after i talked to josh uh he was a, a smooth he was officially out of the team so I, I'll, I'll say this like i i think steel is one of those people who you know he's he's getting on now he's like knocking on the door at 30 if he hasn't already turned 30 i think he's actually turned 30 i think he had his he birthday. must be surely by now yeah, so it's like, he's not going to put up with any nonsense. And for me, Smooye is a player who, while he was far and away the best player on this roster, I, I think we're getting to a point now where people are starting to feel that the talent just doesn't outweigh the bullshit that sort of comes with having to play with him. Like, you know, it might be fun for everybody at home when, when some guy is like literally screaming and screeching, you know, every time he gets like some kills and they win around. That might be hype. And interesting, and obviously it gave us that great bit of content about him being the Rat King with Anders doing his best David Attenborough impression. But um, the, the I think the long term effects of playing with somebody like that it's very wearing. And this, if you're a methodical player that wants everybody to be on the same page and not kind of involved in any nonsense and shenanigans, I, I can imagine that pissing you off. So uh, this is kind of what we always earmark. Like we've had some predictions wrong on this show down the years, but when Smoothie left big, the one thing we did say was, was he ever going to have enough clout just in terms of his talent and viability um, to, to warrant all of the baggage that comes with him? And when you're sure, there's all this stuff around it, but I think if I think if he was well-liked enough and the team weren't a little bit in an org, weren't a little bit jaded by his inclusion. I think they find a work around here. I think they wait until COVID's over. It, it could just be at the end of April when life goes back to normal. That might be optimistic in some people's eyes. But the fact that they weren't even willing to wait a few weeks and see how it all, you know, where the chips fall kind of suggests that there was a bit more going on there for me. The only thing is, though, like, as much as I agree with most of that, like, the problem is it really was like a beggars can't be choosers scenario, as unfortunate yeah. as just the situation steals in. Because if you watch their team play in Flashpoint without Smuya, they're, they're achieving miracles by even winning some of these games, making them close. Like, the yeah. actual personnel he's working with is fucking appalling. Because for yeah. people who don't realize, it is so extreme the number of players who want to play in the major, even if it just means the major qualifier, that they'll never even make it to the minor. That 
like as you saw when we added the bad news bears team that's playing in place of fpx mate they have better players man for man than seal does in chaos like it's yeah. actually appalling some of the talent he's got like that cam guy on chaos i don't know him but he's just fucking garbage at cs so like, he's not a good player the voltage player who plays smooya is just like literally just an average opera like doesn't seem totally terrible but he certainly isn't like a playmaker he's a star player so when you look at their teams and no joke like steel's top fragging half the time and the fact yep. that they're getting any of these wins are coming close i mean listen it makes him look fucking awesome but it's one of those scenarios where it's like a moral victory because he's not going to win the tournament like, he's just not gonna, it's not possible with this lineup in my opinion so i feel for him i think he's in a fucking terrible situation yeah, and and again, we, we it all boils down to the age-old question of, you know, why why is he even in the situation he's in? Why why are we still talking about a player being perma banned for a very uh, by co comparison to some of the other shit that goes on low-level offense um, for five fucking years? And yeah, I mean, I, I won't rehash that material uh, since we're pressed for time, but uh, I, I said it on on the broadcast. I just think it's just fucking ridiculous at this point that Valve is sticking to their guns when the scene looks not the scene now in 2020 looks absolutely nothing like the scene did in 2015. Um, and the idea that there should be holdovers for things that are no longer viable, no longer possible, just because in that particular moment you were interested enough to issue a lifetime ban and then you've gone back to turning a blind eye to the multitude of matches that are fixed <clears throat> especially in china uh which again you know i don't see anybody talking about that fucking captain mo uh exchange that he put out like people have just forgot about that like oh captain i'll tell you mo... a detail actually rich it is an interesting yeah. little anecdote you might like I went, yeah. I, what I'll do is I'll hi, I'll obscure the identity so you just get the scale that it's on, but you don't know the specifics of it. So I went to an event in China. I'll just say within the last two years to make it comfy and make it so that people can't narrow it down too much. Yeah, I went sure. to an event in China in the last couple of years and mm. outside this hotel, because one of the famous things about also why you never hear Westerners complain about China and the current political situation is if you go to a tournament in China, you are probably being paid more than your day rate and yep. being put in like a five-star hotel. Like some oh, of the yeah. hotels we've been in in China, like I've been in one, like that Shangri-La in Shanghai. That's like, apparently it's like world famous for how fucking amazing it is. Like it's one of those ones where the buffet is like every type of food in the world that you can just choose from and go and get exactly that moment. So you can see the level we're on. So when people get that level of opulence luxury they turn a blind eye to everything right so when we're at oh, this hotel that's why they because do of it. the because of the background of the circumstances of where we are yeah no worries uh yeah there we go the power wasn't on uh because of the circumstances right it wasn't really surprising to me that outside this hotel there was like a lamborghini park parked there because what you mm. think is well i'm in one of the best hotels in the world could be like uh by the way this wasn't actually at the shangri-la again i'm just saying this is the sort of place we stay but you know you see a lamborghini you think right it must be a rich businessman or maybe it's like uh, um you know some sort of international politician or something's got his car there a celebrity could it be any of these people right oh no it turned out that lamborghini belonged to a fucking Chinese pro CSGO player. Now, if you know anything about the salaries that those players make, that's impossible. That is impossible. You couldn't even, yeah, unless, unless, unless literally this was set up so that I could see it and they'd rented it for one day, you wouldn't even be able to afford the insurance on it with the salary that a pro Chinese CSGO player makes. No, of course not. So as soon as you find that detail out, like I don't yeah. even need to say anymore, everyone else can surely figure out in their brain what that means. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, and like I said, the Captain Mo thing is absolutely outrageous because it, it shows how he made it sound matter of fact, didn't he? Yeah, he, the, it shows how delusional they are when it comes to the matter of match fixing. How like how normal it is to them. He put out me messages saying, "Well, yeah, he, he, here's a message of me openly discussing throwing matches with a known." Uh, a person that pays people and induces people to throw matches. Now, Valve have made that abundantly clear that engaging in that kind of behavior is against what they consider to be within the remit of a pro for obvious reasons. They've said so. They've, they've openly said so. There will never be any action. 
against Captain Mo. In fact, he's, by all intents and purposes, potentially playing in Rio. So, um, the, although that, we'll talk about the... If it happens. The, oh, yeah, we'll talk about the... Yeah, that too. But we'll talk about the overhaul that's going on there. And and I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. We all know what's going on. I'll sit here. I'm not going to lie about... I'm not going to fucking tell the lies. You sit here and you watch these fucking games in, in, the, in China and everyone can see what's going on from the swings in odds. I've got a guy who fucking... Uh, sends me across every big swing uh, that happens in 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 betting, and and some of these are in like MDL as well. No one gives a fuck. Like ESIC monitor this stuff, and they supposedly have valves here. So why is nothing getting done about it? You know, and and then you start asking yourself, well, what really can they do about it? Well, the first thing you have to do is accept that um, skins like. I, I, Valve put the fucking lead in the water. So that's that's point number one that they should be mindful of. Skins betting is completely different to cash betting, yes. in my opinion. Yes, um, they're shouldn't, Yeah, and shouldn't be viewed anywhere near as serious, nor should Valve be looking to defer to journalists and leagues and stuff about stuff that happened at that time. They put the lead in the water, they deliberately stepped back from skins, and they, they were giving out the API to these gambling sites. In many ways, you have to accept that they were kind of partnered with these sites. They let them have the access to the data, they allowed them to create, they didn't shut down the gambling sites as soon as they saw them. And you know why Valve didn't do that? Because they like to sit back and watch how things play out so they have data, so they can talk about it. But the, 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 this led to this unbelievable rush of pros, many of whom are still playing now, losing games on purpose to get their inventory up. And at, and at worst, I can probably point to at least one major winner that I know was active in sharing information with these gambling syndicates about what their pros, what, what their fellow pros were doing. You know, like messaging them, saying, oh, they're going to kick him from the team, so you might want to bet against them today because there's a lot of tensions in the team and they just want to get their games over with. Messages like this. This should all carry a penalty. But instead, what they did is they came in, absolutely crucified eye by power, and went, there you go, that proves that we give a shit. And then we went back to letting everything be a fucking shitty garbage sewer in, in Counter-Strike for, for however many years until they shut down the casinos because they were compelled to do it by multiple class action lawsuits and evidence of potential criminality. It, it's absurd. And meanwhile, the hermetically sealed environment of China continue to just get away with doing whatever the fuck they want. No one's ever going to fuck with them because if you fuck with them and criticize them, you lose your right to do business there and you watch billions of dollars fly out the fucking window. If that is your stance, and that is obviously the stance of every corporation in the world, uh, including the media now that are trying to make out that the Chinese response to coronavirus was was very proportional and very good, uh, because it's all co corporate-owned media, and they and you know it, if if you're Disney, you want to sell a movie in China, so you better have your news outlet ABC say China actually did great, and they're definitely not lying about their numbers. If that is the stance of every corporation in America, don't crucify people for little lapses in morality yeah, exactly. when yours looms so large over, the, over that. It is, it is a smear on everything that you're trying to moralize about. So that, I've said this many, many times. Uh, m m match fixing is not treated equally. And Steel has been absolutely crucified, and all of those kids were crucified. All those guys were crucified uh, for doing a very minor offence and the type of minor, of, and, and and there are far worse things going on now, uh, and certainly in China. I mean, essentially, uh, right. at this point in time, Steel's biggest mistake was not being Chinese, it wasn't <laughs> even match fixing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If he'd if he'd been if he'd been a Chinese pro, I by power just doesn't happen. <laughs> that's that's the absurdity of it all. Ridiculous. Uh, anyway, let's uh, jump on to the next story. Um, let's talk about one team kind of closing down. I don't know. I'm sure this is absolutely heartbreaking for you. Uh, the old Avangar team. So Avangar, they obviously had a team that made it to uh, a major final. Um, then they sold that roster, uh, which had some very promising players. Uh, on the roster to Virtus Pro since that team has moved on to Virtus Pro. They've been pretty fucking terrible, if we're all <laughs> honest about it. Um, and now Avangar have announced that they're going to be ceasing operations after approximately three years in the business. Uh, their statement said, 
it's difficult to say goodbye after all we have done for the community players and company staff. Massive pat on the back there. Um, well done. So sad us. that we're saying, That's yeah, so, so it. sad. <laughs> It's not, not it's sad to be leaving the community. It's just so sad after all the great stuff we've done. Um, you must be you must be really upset about it. Uh, anyway, to be a part of the process behind an esports organization is incredible. And I will always remember with warmth the days when I spent with our teams and saw that they discovered something new with us. I would like to thank every single person that played their part in our history and also those that followed it. Well, I'm going to say he's really overselling uh, what a Vanguard was, basically for me, how I'm going to remember a Vanguard is, and see if you disagree with this, they were an organization that was shrouded in mystery. Nobody knew their financial particulars. They looked out by picking up a team that actually had some talent on it, uh, punched well above their weight class as a result of that in, in the international rankings, probably weren't able to monetize it, sold the team, no doubt, for a massive profit because of the weird nightmare that is the CIS region when it comes to contracts. And this guy probably has walked away from uh, esports with a few mils in his pocket as a result, and will never look back and never give a fuck about esports again. Has anyone you, noticed you, a trend emerging here where if you're from the CIS region and you're not called Navi or Virtus Pro, what you do is once as you as you align as you talked about there, the same thing with QBF, all these teams, Simon Gaming. Yeah. What happens yeah. is when you get lucky and you get a team where you struck gold. These guys get it that they struck gold. So as soon as they've sold the team, they're like, well, fuck that. I'm not putting money in CS again. That's just throwing money in a black hole. So mm. fuck it. Just cash out. Off I go. Yeah. I mean, the joke is, Avanga, crazy. These are like the only teams in the fucking world making money from Counter-Strike because they they actually parlay the one little success they had in is selling the players and then just quit the game. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it, it's so mind blowing to me as well. Like when I was hearing about some of the, um, you know, deals, like I say, the team that is now uh, contact in, in, in Flashpoint being sold for like 1.2 million and stuff. There's this, there's this weird indentured servitude fucking vibe going on with like these shady organizations that like find, you know, they've got no history. They've got no pedigree. They've got no business acumen. They're run by some essentially glorified bedroom CEO who just because he has a line of credit better than the average fucking bedroom dweller uh, is able to contract players mostly on promises and lies and then sell them for actual tangible m amounts of money at the end. Um, it, it, it seems that we've gone beyond what it used to be back in the day, which was it was just a vanity project for fucking failed business money sports. You know, they would fuck up uh, in the real world and then they would come to esports and they would all have like impressionable young adults around them that they could, you know, ha live out their little money ball you know, esports own uh, sports owner fantasy in front of. Uh, now people are legitimately creating esports organizations uh, just in the hope that they're able to contract some talented players in a region and potentially sell them on. In fact, it reminds me, if you remember the old agent for Carlos Tevez, you remember that oh, when yes. he was just yes. owned by the one guy and was sold to West Ham. He didn't play on a team. He was essentially owned by his agent. Uh, yeah, it's a really weird situation. Yeah, in the CIS remember, region. I don't, know if, I don't know if that's actually the same guy, but if you remember famously, mm. that was what happened. If you remember during the World Cup when Croatia, no, not Croatia, which team am I thinking of? Was it Croatia who made the final of the World Cup? Yeah, I mean, they, they've yeah, definitely... with Modric. Yeah, yeah it was Croatia, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Croatia yeah. made that final, a story came out, which I remember telling you about, where there was... Everyone was laughing because there's some, like, legendary agent guy who's from that region who actually dealt with players like Modric, where basically he did the same thing. It's like you weren't buying that player from their old team or wherever they were now. You basically bought him from the agent, and the agent was just somehow... Somehow that was, like, taken as standard, and, like, these people had, like, even, like, political power in these countries. And so it actually just reminded me of CIS region in CS in that regard because you, you see... There's all these Western companies try to like normally on business levels do interaction. And you know, it's no deals can ever get done. But when it's yeah. within the bubble of CIS region, you can get deals that don't even make sense being done where like some nobody player goes to Navi or suddenly like, as you say, a t I, I mean, one of them happened today, um, yesterday rather. So mm. we've all heard for the last five years, Angel's not for sale. And then they just cut him anyway <laughs> after like five years. What is this? Like, yeah. this the whole re the whole region is upside down. It's like going through the fucking looking glass when you go into that scene. So. Well, I, I, I have a thought we'll get to when we talk about it. Well, uh, that, that maybe Hellraisers might not be too far behind Vanguard, honestly. I, I, I have a suspicion.
that that's what that indicates that they're sort of maybe not as interested anymore uh but whatever we'll, we'll come with that in a moment uh yeah i, I totally agree I, I think um it it is strange um I, I bet if we looked into a vanguard and their business as well it'd be registered to like a, a, a domestic residence they never had offices you know the the esports organization aspect is almost an afterthought you get your team you get your players locked into contracts and you look to sell them and there are certain regions where this weirdness happens more often china again is another one because lol player rights in china uh brazil uh the, the cis region and there are players being you know essentially pressured into signing you know because of the economic realities that they face being pressured into signing long contracts with insane buyouts that essentially mean that you either make millions for your own and are pushed into a position where you might be playing well out your comfort zone, well out your region. Who fucking knows where you're going to end up? They will literally sell you to the highest bidder if it's viable. Um, but also, you're in a position where you go down with the fucking Titanic. I mean, think about the Fury of players and the five-year contracts. It still remains unthinkable to me that that is a real uh, thing that occurred. And their entire careers were fucking, you know, radically altered as a result. Um, so just be, let's jump into the Angel Hellraiser thing. Um, let, let's talk about that. Obviously, you've said for a while, you know, that Angel and, and Hellraisers, it's the blood pact. You know, it, we must be in end times now if Angel's actually been dropped from Hellraisers. And by all accounts, that sounds like what, what, what is happening. They benched the entire team, released Angel. Mate, it sounds like some out of fucking revelations. And lo, I saw yeah. an angel rise from the hell. Like, you know, what the fuck is this yeah. shit like? <laughs> no, exactly. It's, it's mental. Like, I'm actually starting to believe that we are in the fucking end of days because uh, it's so so crazy but uh basically this is why i think hellraisers might Shout be like pass. <laughs> <laughs> one of the all-time great this tracks is... <clears throat> absolutely um <clears throat> this is why i think maybe uh we're gonna see um hellraisers kind of shut uh, operation because they've completely just let their team go uh the that player nookie it, um, he's already said that I'm definitely not sticking around. I don't care if they make a new team. I'm 100% out. I'm available. I consider myself to be in free agency, essentially. Um, but I, the, the fact that they've released Angel um, and he has said, I'm completely open to offers. There's no contracts to worry about. I want to kickstart. Uh, I just didn't think we would ever see him at another organization. He's been at Hellraisers for six years. There are so few players in the history of esports that even have that kind of association with any org anywhere in the world. Um, it, it's crazy to me. So then it was also then it like three years ago that people actually wanted him. That's why it's so pointless now that it's happened. Like the angel that everyone wanted to join Navi, if everyone forgets that storyline, when Zeus got kicked and then they still had Starx, everyone once Starx couldn't be the coach anymore, everyone wanted the angel to join and that was at the time it seemed like the perfect meeting well the point is now it's too late isn't it? it's like this is like the lucas to mibr too late trade but even worse it's like three years late instead of one year late or whatever yeah well so that was going to be the next question i was going to ask i mean it's incredible to me he still seems to have like very high stock in people's minds um which is weird when you think about what Hellraisers have been doing the last few years. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to think of the last time I watched a Hellraisers match. You know, they've just not been at any of the relevant uh, competitions. Uh, After Watson certainly... left, they basically haven't been a relevant team. Like, exactly, they had Oscar yeah. for a while, everyone even forgets that. That's how that's how irrelevant they've been for the last year, year mm. and a half, it feels like. It's been a while. And Angel, obviously, within that, as. uh a 30-year-old in-game leader, if you go and look at his stats and, and what, what he's been doing statistically, he's down in the doldrums, he's at the Zeus levels, you know, he, he's he, not a fragging in-game leader by any stretch of the imagination, that's fine, it's not what you associate him with, but there is something, you know, awful to see that when, I'm just looking at his last few games here, teams I've never heard, but you know, this guy is struggling to get double digits, again, Pomper, Cyber Legacy, Scardy, you know, it's like, come on, man, like, fucking, I, I, pe people are saying, ooh, you know, imagine if we could get him, you know, to this team and that team, I think people are going to be very disappointed with the reality of what happens, I mean, first of all, I can't even think of an organization he could slip into right now and immediately improve, uh, and if he wants to build a team, 
well, I can't think of any serious team, any high level team that doesn't all uh, that hasn't already settled on a roster. Immediately, you're probably looking. He's going to have to go outside of the top twenty. I don't know what, I, but I don't know what opportunities would look like for him there. I know he can speak English. I think the immediate thing that people would say, the immediate move for me, is he goes back to Virtus Pro, right? Like he's obviously got an association with that organization in the past. Um, Adrian is playing terribly. I don't think he's going to be an upgrade in firepower, but maybe he can take over the in-game leader mantle over there. Maybe do something with those players. Outside of that, I don't know what the opportunities for Angel look like in 2020. I think he's very much missed the window to go and cre create another good. I don't think it's possible for him. Yeah, I mean, as I said, everyone basically, in fact, I'd even heard behind the scenes that I think I think it was even in those reports about it at the time that it, Na'Vi wanted him. Like, he was the player they were going to recruit as the IGL. So he could have been a Na'Vi when they had Simple and fucking Guardian and all the sick players we all remember. So not only has he missed that window, but it also wasn't just the transfer. His career has missed the window because at the time they wanted to do that move, if you remember in 2017, there was like a nice stretch of time where he actually was even fragging super well. He was like one of the best fragging IGLs in the game. And his numbers yep. were great. This is when he was with Sticko and all those guys, when he had that like mixture of like, I don't know, like Balkan area people or whatever. So yeah, that strange team that obviously later on, we all know what happened to them. Most of them actually quit playing Zero, all those guys. So I think the saddest thing for me is he really had a legit window where he could have had like a last chapter to his career because he's a pretty storied player. He's been on CIS region a long, long time. And the reason why I think that's sad is because not only did it look like the right move, but because he's a veteran and he's been in successful teams, I think he would have actually had the ear of some of the younger players. And it would have it would have made sense. It would have been a pretty good slot in. Whereas I think even going back a year or so, I don't think anyone would have been particularly on the table at that point in time, mm -hmm. to get a player like he's pretty old as a player, remember as well. Like I'm going to guess he's at least thirty. He's thirty. There we go. Yeah. So he is thirty. Like yeah. as you say, what sort of who who's in the who's in the market for a thirty year old Ukrainian IGL who hasn't even made the top level for the last few years? Probably no one, right? I mean, it's yeah, like, like you say, well, it's, it's basically like, just the Virtus Pro like, that might take yeah, you off. It has to be Virtus Pro, I think, if he's going to get any opportunity to play at a reputable organization ever again. I think it, it's got to be that move. Adrian's obviously needs to be cut from that team, 100%. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they're struggling for direction, struggling for tactics, clearly. That's something he's going to bring to the table. I think he will be on a a par with what Adrian is producing in terms of firepower. I don't think they're going to immediately like, oh, it's an upgrade, everything's fixed, you know, hip, hip, hooray. But I think if he goes there, I mean, I first probably have to do something. I mean, like, like we can talk about oh, them. they're in deep shit, man. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're embarrassing at this stage. And, you know, they're another team, much like Ents and Sir teams down the years, where it's like, they keep talking about all these changes they're making, and then it's the same old, same old shit every time they go on the server. And it's 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 just disrespectful to the fans. It's disingenuous. We know you're not changing anything. What you're changing is you think over distance and time, you're just going to suddenly pull a win out and go, see, we fixed the problems. It is evident that you are not making change. Um, Virtus Pro, they talked about how they were having a big overhaul. Uh, I, I think that overhaul has to start with a roster change, realistically, for them. I don't think Adra has been the move for them. He's been a pretty poor pickup, all things all things said and done. He wasn't even and that then, good at the major when they had their best no, ever on. <laughs> exactly. So so I, I think I think um you have to make that cut now and Angel that is the one spot I can see him ending up. If if they haven't already had talks about it, I'd be very sorry. Um speaking of uh washed up CIS players, also do want to say Doge double boy Doge's I can't believe this is a thing. After the, I mean, he's been pretty unlucky. He he was going out to uh, the Chinese org, I think one three, um, where you know he was going to make some big fat Chinese money, um, and then of course COVID nineteen occurs. So he's like, well, probably not worth getting the COVID for. So I'm gonna come back to the CIS region, and I will be available for work. He's announced this team now called Mustang Crew, and with the exception of who um, the the players on the on the roster aren't really players I've ever heard of, and and they're not young either. I mean, keep my mind one. That is a veritable grandfather in in esports and in, in Counter Strike. 
Uh, and on top of that, he's going to be playing with a 26-year-old, 28-year-old, a 24-year-old, and uh, some young 19-year-old who's probably going to have to do all the heavy lifting. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this this ended up anywhere better, or do you think Doge is another one of those players where it's like, steal a, f a few checks before I retire? No, the problem is Dorsey's career. If if you like, put it this way, if you took the name play off, there's not a single even even. I mean, even this level team wouldn't pick him up. Like he's basically done in his career. But he is still a name. Obviously, I mean, he's literally a major winner. He's obviously accomplished a lot of things and a very decorated career. I think the saddest thing about this for me is obviously the last few years, Dorsey was only famous as a meme. That was the only way mm, that like people exactly. knew him and he got fair. But what people won't realize is within the CIS region. He is literally considered like, well, at least at one point in time, he was supposed to be like one of their neo or forest type players. That's like the level this guy was actually on. I remember actually Hooch, who you referenced earlier, when it was the end of 1.6, Dorsia came along in like the last three or four years of 1.6. I remember him saying in an interview once this line that stuck with me where he said, because at the time there was two players that came up at a similar time. It was, and they were both playing for the same team. There's a player called Romschka, who was in like the, actually Virtus Pro as well. And then there was Dorsia. And I remember the way Hooch described it was he said, Romschka is a really good player, really good talent, like skilled player. But the difference is Dorsia is like a player from heaven. Like the, the idea is he was supposed to be like the chosen one who was going to, turn the fortunes of CIS region around. Now, he only was really good in CSGO, realistically, for the first couple of years, but he was someone who had an immense talent at one point in time. The problem is, even when he was at his best, he had certain flaws to his game, where like he doesn't seem like he communicates very well, he's a bit of a beta in terms of how he played, and very slow. So the problem is, if you have flaws when you're the absolute best, when you're a bad player, when you're way past your sell by date, and you definitely haven't corrected any of those flaws, there's not really any reason for anyone to recruit you except your name. And as you can see here, like, we barely even know who the fuck this team is. So this just sounds like another chapter of what something I've referenced many times, which is I think a lot of CIS players, just because of the money, maybe even this team, who knows, maybe this team could pay like $1,000 a month or something. Like, so a lot of them will stick around way, way longer than anyone in the West will, just because it's a way to make a salary. Like, it's a way to make an all right. Like, I'm sure for wherever he's from, it's probably not terrible. He's making some yeah. little bit of scratch on the side, keep doing what you've been doing for the last 20 years or whatever. Yeah, why not? And Kern's competitive in, like, relevance. It's completely irrelevant. I don't think you'll ever see him ever play another game that any sizable amount of people will care about in some meaningful sense, probably. Um. So, Sam, I'll just quickly say, because uh, as my chat has decided to do, the one thing that will fucking piss me off, <laughs> and that is that Tell you like if it. something is obvious and self-evident, someone's already said it, mate. Someone's already pointed it out. You, you don't need to. It doesn't need to be you. It doesn't need to be you. The, the, let the moron say the obvious thing that everyone's already said. Why Why do I need a hundred message? Yeah, my audio is breaking up. Would you like to try and uh, change I did uh, that Discord already. Service? It didn't seem to help. But I didn't, try didn't help. Is it lagging okay. when we're talking? No, no, just Richard's um, dropping. Just for me, up. apparently. I don't know why oh, I'm okay. getting some pops and stuff. Oh, yeah. Try it again. Yeah, we'll just try changing servers again, see if that fixes it. Um, we we'll, we'll should talk about the big story and make sure we have enough time for that. And that is what's going on with the Rio Major. Obviously, we haven't done an event, uh, sorry, done a show since that event has been pushed back to November. Um, I, 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 I want, so we can talk about that, first of all, the decision to sort of push. There's going to be one major this year. It's going to be in November, assuming everything is resolved by then. Um, and uh, what Valve have done, and I'll give them credit for this, because they absolutely didn't have to do it, uh, is they've smashed together the prize pool from the two majors into one. So we've got $2 million instead of the $1 million for uh, prize pools. Uh, so I, I think overall, with, with the global situation, you can't really argue or fault that they are, you know, the decision to move the major back to a more realistic time frame when hopefully things are going to be resolved. Um, I'm sure it's been like a logistical issue. I kind of feel a little bit sorry for ESL as well, because for people who know about event logistics, all of these things are planned months in advance. And, you know, oh, you they'll know, be just... losing the fuck to just from deposits, et cetera, if you are. Yeah, exactly. Think about like, the stadium or the hotels, et cetera, you'll put in your initial booking with. You don't get all that money back for sure. Yeah, I mean, like when you yeah when you put down a booking on a venue, on the cleaning teams, you know, on 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 production com local production companies, if you have to use them, obviously you're not getting any of that money back because they have taken a window from potential work. And yeah, so I mean, ESL will have lost a lot of money on this and coming coming so soon. 
of the um, Katowice disappointment. And also, there was an announcement that they put out on the MTG website where they were just saying, I, I actually tweeted about it, um, yep. uh, but it doesn't seem to have kind of taken off. Uh, but they, they have said that overall, with the even though they've been able to pivot and have online competitions, they're expecting their revenue for the first half of the year to be down 35% on esports. I believe if the in the same the thing you're referring to, the report that they themselves put out, they even mm -hmm. say that MTG within its esports uh, companies, something mental like that they have to like make up for like a $15 million fucking like deficit or something. Because mm -hmm. it was in Swedish Krona, but it was like, you know, 150 yeah, million. Yeah. So it's like roughly 10 to 1. So somehow they have to basically slash $15 million out of the DreamHack and ESL budgets. I, I think that means. Yeah, well, I'll, 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 I've got I've got a statement in front of me. I'll I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, what they put out: revenues in the esports vertical is expected to decline by thirty five to forty five percent in the first half of twenty twenty in comparison to the same period in twenty nineteen. This is predominantly driven by owned and operated in esports services events either being cancelled, moved online, or postponed. Uh, the Q1 2020 esports revenue will decline by approximately 25% compared to the same period in 2019. Having to operate already committed events with no audience or cancel events at short notice means there are limited possibilities to reduce the cost base in this quarter. From Q2 of 2020, ESL and DreamHack are both reducing the cost of goods sold and fixed costs. These savings will be at least 150 million Swedish krona for the first half of 2020 and a designed to protect business continuity and the future potential of the operations when the current crisis comes to an end so that sentence that is the one duncan's referring to and it basically says like yeah we're gonna have to slash operations to the bone i think dreamhack is going to be the the company that obviously feels the the pain more than esl esl seems to at least be doing expansive stuff dreamhack we all know it's contracting it's winding down um it's a shadow of its former self i mean that's just apparent from the events that they put on and that we know we know from having worked those events they were trying to cut corners back in like 2015 they were trying to cut corners in 2016 so it, it, it's that always seems to be the one that has to make way uh when when cuts are made so i, mean, I, I can tell you to this day even before mm. the coronavirus shit they still are a to that even for dream like masters will pay less than some of the rates for the other tournaments so like they already as to just corroborate we say that we're obviously already feeling the pinch in the margins and that's before yeah. all this shit yes so it's going to be um it's going to be a a, 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 bit, a tough time in that same statement mtg are looking to assure shareholders um saying the group remains well funded with a net cash position of 1.8 billion swedish krona at the end of q4 2019 now uh, that, that that's fine i mean understand that's the parent company they're talking about that's them mtg not just the esports vertical the esports vertical uh, has been very badly hit. Their gaming verticals are up because everyone sat at home playing fucking video games or bored out their minds or not able to go to work. So, um, you know, but, but it's not offsetting the difference. So, I mean, the first thing is, like, I, I do want to say that I feel uh, very, very sorry for ESL being in this situation. Um, majors don't make you a lot of money anyway. To be losing money on the major before you even get a chance to hold the major... Um, I mean, there's a zero chance they turn a profit on it now. And, um, you know, I keep saying it for all this weird, you know, ESL versus Flashpoint, um, you know, back and forth that the community are having, uh, the, the reality is just quite simple. We've seen from the broadcasts competition is good, right? Uh, we've seen that uh, more people are interested in Counter Strike than has been for a while. We're on the up. We're potential. We're, we're arguably the number one esport in the world right now uh, in terms of the engagement we're getting and the growth we're experiencing. If ESL don't exist, that is very precarious. And equally, if companies don't come into the space to try and force ESL to be a little bit more magnanimous and a little bit less evil empire-ish in their outlook, that's also jeopardized. Uh, the community never seemed to really look at the bigger picture. Um, so I'm hoping yeah, by the way, I would agree the with the sentiment. I mean, it's basically what I said on that episode where we had Dan Fiden on. This is actually before mm. I declared war on ESL due to the fucking EPL slot thing, which is, mm. I would reiterate what I said there. The best case scenario for everyone in CS 
is to simultaneously have ESL in the space, running most of the tournaments they do now with like 60, 70% of the calendar, but kept on side, as it were, and within check by some competition that can force them to do things the right way. I mean, by the way, if you as someone who doesn't like Flashpoint, do you, do you like Astralis? Do you like ESL Pro League? Well, if you do, you can thank Flashpoint for making them better. Because guess what? The only reason why all those EPL teams magically last minute went to EPL is because they got a better deal out of it. That's what they were doing all those months when no one knew who was going to play in all the leagues. They got a better deal by competition. So, yeah. like, to me, it's not about, like, who you want to win and who you want to lose. What sort of scene do you want to be in? And at the moment, that's the best case scenario for everyone. So it actually hurts everyone when you get all this downturn economically right now, and obviously everyone's going to have to slash budgets. And actually, I mean, you can kind of tie this to a lot of stories going on right now. You even saw, I noticed, this just shows you how dog shit journalists are in our space, Rich. Like, I haven't seen a single person even comment on fucking Astralis themselves saying that their employees are taking a 30% salary cut voluntarily. That yeah. is not even a story in this fucking community. Why is everyone so shit? Why is everyone a fucking moron with a Twitter account who's French or a fucking former RuneScape hacker and you all think you're hooked into our scene and you're an insider? You don't even know the fucking publicly announced stories going on. Never mind what's going on behind the scenes where you morons think like Thorin personally invented viewbotting yesterday as a way to secretly get more viewers, you daft cunt. It's been going on by everyone t since your dot. Like, this is mental. Oh, the real well, stories don't get discussed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought it up, actually, because uh, I wanted to say something. Because um, obviously, I've been. I was mad critical of Activision Blizzard when they were doing embedding, um, and I'm mad critical of anybody. And, I, and I'll explain why. And I'll exp and, and people made some points going, "Ha!" Ah, but Valve do embedding because they play the stream when you load up the game. At least you have to actually opt in and load up the game there. Sure. You're not like just actively browsing a completely different website. And then I saw some people arguing, well, it's just the same as running an ad. No, it isn't. An ad saying, come watch this is not the same as forcing me to watch this because it's on in the background unknowingly to me uh because i just happened to be browsing a website you've paid to run it um embedding is has become popular for a lot of reasons and i'll explain what those reasons are first of all digital media is on its ass and they're taking any kind of advertisement money that they can um and even though the, the, the digital media uh, companies can serve you millions tens of millions of views uh what what they can't do is effectively monetize that because everyone's using ad block ad revenues are down in general um you know they're, they're, it's been diminishing returns for years all of the big media companies you know and think are big and powerful are continually bailed out quarter after quarter by vc money from political operatives essentially in a lot of uh in a lot of examples. Literally. Um, I mean, if people don't yeah. know, years and years ago, when President Obama was in office, he this is all public information, he literally bailed out the media, essentially. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, can't think why they would then be asleep at the wheel while he's drone striking schools. Um, you know, but, uh, but of course, remember, the Obama administration, they never had a scandal, apparently, according to the modern media today. Uh, but whatever, that's fine. That's for a separate podcast. Uh, but anyway, so... I'll criticize anybody for doing it, and I'll explain why, why I'm criticizing people for doing it, because our industry is ramping up to a critical mass and a reckoning that actually might be precipitated by COVID. Um, there's been positives that you can deduce from eSports. The fact that we're not like an NBA, we can have our leagues played online, and it's not great and it's not ideal, but we fucking get them done, and we meet sponsor obligations, and we have a competition, and we have something to talk about. And actually, ESL has been setting viewing records during this time. Um, all of which is very good for the long-term health of the Counter-Strike scene. But equally, what COVID is likely to do, we're about to fucking find out who is serious about this esports shit right here because a lot of them are taking revenue from marketing arms and marketing arms are getting slashed to the bone. We've got 10 million Americans applying for unemployment bailouts. We've got companies going under. We've got tech startups just shutting shop now because it's not even worth trying to fucking cut costs this is th this could spark a great recession and i've lived through recessions and let me tell you esports gets hit when recessions come rolling around because a lot of our money is uh t taken on the promise of growing 
we grow it. It's an investment. It is, it is, it is marketing money. So we, we could be hitting a rude awakening in esports here. And so it becomes drastically important that we stop misrepresenting what we are. We stop misrepresenting how big we are. We have an ethical and moral obligation now because of the financial situation globally to stop lying about how big our dicks are we have to stop doing that we have to be truthful and unfortunately embedding is one of the cardinal sins in the industry because much like what we found out about facebook because facebook were just lying about uh, uh viewer numbers i was talking about it with eric uh, flom on the stream the other day on facebook if you scrolled past the video counted as a view and so they were saying, look, we're delivering your product to millions of people. They're being sued for that. Rightly fucking yeah. so. Like how much, how, how much, how much bullshit do you want to tell? Because let me tell you, wait, these companies now more than ever are going to be taking a long, hard look at what we're doing in esports and wondering whether it's worth investing. And if they see that you're lying about the numbers and not being a good business partner and artificially inflating stuff by putting stuff on the front of a website or paying other websites to fucking do it. They are going to head for the hills and come back and they're going to go, they're a bunch of fucking hucksters. You, ha you can't do it anymore. You've got to stop. Activision Blizzard, by the way, man, wait till the fallout of the Overwatch League hits. They have been absolutely destroyed by coronavirus over there. They had to cancel all their homestand events. It's done. Those live events that were meant to be the big turning point of the league and prove that regional fucking esports was viable, they're not even happening. Those were the revenue streams for those investors that paid 20 mil. Well, guess what? They're not, that's one, that is, that was meant to be the core revenue stream and it's not there anymore. How do you think these big sports groups are thinking? And then they go on to YouTube. Do you know how many people were watching last week? 41,000 people peak viewership <laughs> for a fucking 25 million dollar buy-in league they have been ravaged by this they were already on the fucking ropes so let me tell you it's all it, it is a house of fucking cards my friends and one of them's going to come down and esports will fall in on itself do not be part of the problem be part of the fucking solution by being honest upfront with realistic projections about your growth and actually support our our business partners support the sponsors that come in the space and make esports possible by not lying to them now with all of that said people are going to think that is an overture to face it let's be clear about what happened with the face it situation and um and um embedding the uh uh, fucking flashpoint games and what happened was they put the state they highlight streams on the front page of face it which causes hundreds of thousands of people registered to that website because obviously it's a plugging service it's where people go to play so they're not being you know hacked in matchmaking if they have a low trust factor or whatever but they they had embedded the flashpoint stream and then what had happened was they left it up there and it didn't display that it was a rerun and so people who were on the website were boosting the, the numbers ridiculously and artificially. And it was just an accident. And they took it down when they, when they realized. And I don't know if they'll do it again. So it's, it's, it's not like they were using the curse network or something like that. Uh, like, you know, some Twitch partners did. Um, it, was, it was something that they were trying out. And then they forgot to take it down for the reruns. Um, so it's not, it's not a big cardinal sin but it's still it's still something i will criticize for sure yeah the problem um, with that whole situation is if it's up to me i wouldn't do something like that guess what i have no knowledge of any of that sort of stuff going on. i'm not on faceit.com anyway I'm, I'm fucking doing the event but what people won't realize is this is you you can't convince the business people in esports to not do those things because unfortunately what they see is it's nothing legal about doing it it's just like mildly immoral basically so what they'll say is well everyone else is doing it like i would this is the analogy i would give it's like weight cutting in combat sports mm. objectively if everyone agreed to not weight cut it would be better for everyone nobody would have like brain damage from being dehydrated and getting hit in the head no one would ever have a dangerous weight cut where they potentially could die from that you wouldn't just wreck your, your body and then yeah. rehydrate it you know all the stuff that's terrible for you but the problem is why does everyone in combat sports wake up because everyone else does so if you don't you're just to them not 
taking advantage of something you could take advantage of and just give, and as a result, relatively ceding an advantage to your opponent. Yep. Now, Doping I personally in wouldn't cycling do that. as well, right? But exact same shit. I hope it goes without saying one, that's way above my pay grade. Two, it's nothing I'm even aware is going on. And three, sadly, as Richard alluded to, pretty much everyone in esports does it, unfortunately. So yeah. I, I'm with you. I would say let's just not do it at all. Like, because I, I definitely agree with the mechanism you were describing there. The difference is this is in the scenario, first of all, there is a distinction to be made like you did. Like when, when Overwatch League used to embed it on the curse network, they would even embed it muted at the bottom of a page that isn't even yep. about anything to do with that game. On, on and, Dota. On Dota exactly. Page. So the idea yep. there is you were getting counted as a viewer of Owl when you weren't even A, watching it, or B, on that part of the screen. Like that's even worse than the Facebook example. But yep. this case is more like when ESL does it with the SEA, et cetera. That's more like what happens there is I can tell you the mindset of a marketing person. They go, well, boss, we have this captive audience who's doing something related to Counter-Strike, so why don't we show them our stream and then they could watch that? The flaw being that you're not showing them it. You're just putting the stream on. You're not saying, like, as you said with an ad, come and watch the stream, click here to opt in. What you're basically saying is you're already watching the stream yet. Congrats, you're on. And at that point, if the person's like, but I don't want to watch this, even if they exit out, they were counted as a viewer. So that is obviously inherently unethical, isn't it? Like you're being dishonest. Yeah, at the very minimum, you're being quite disingenuous, if not yeah. overtly dishonest with the captain. Yeah, and, and, as, and, as, and as I said, it's a, it's a matter of time before people get sick and tired of that bullshit because they want to know the real numbers. Uh, and, and you've got a right to know the real numbers. As a business partner, if you're investing in something, put it this oh, way, in, in securities and like stock and stuff like that, if I misrepresent how profitable my company is, I've committed fraud, I can go to jail. Like, Oh, absolutely. You know, this is like, some of the things Elon Musk has been getting in trouble the last few years with his Twitter account. Similar yeah, things, exactly. Yeah. yeah, like when he when he got fucking stoned for like the first time and said, oh, I've, I've got Saudi Arabian investors, they're going to be buying at 420 a share. Yeah, he, said, he basically his said... Girlfriend. He, yeah, he said like he would take the company private a certain amount. Now, the problem with that, this is like a good analogy, is that will then influence other people's actions. So similarly, if you tell mm -hmm. someone I have 100,000 viewers when actually you have 20,000, they might invest or give you sponsorship at a level for 100K. And I mean, you've just defrauded them essentially, haven't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, really, really rough one. Uh, like, and, and as I said, people, it, it's become the norm in esports, and it's become the norm in esports because nobody stopped doing it back when we were at a point where we, we were faced with a moral choice. We were faced, we were at the crossroads. Do we want to become an industry that is predicated on bluster and bullshit? Do we want to go back to the bad old days of two thousand and five, two thousand and six, then later two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, where everybody is just lying about everything constantly? to just get more and more and more because everyone's got that fantasy of, hey, I, I was I was in esports in the early days. I'm entitled to get mine now. So I'm going to lie and fuck people over so I can get the fuck out and say, well, it put an extension on my house or it bought me a car or it pay, you know, paid off my mortgage, you know, whatever it is. That, that became a prevalent mindset in, in esports. These people don't believe, or didn't rather, in esports as a successful entity they thought it was a bubble they could exploit like all of the cunts who got into crypto like you know esports is permanent now it's a thing it's never going away it's only going to get bigger i've been saying this since 2005 societal trends tell you this cannot fail it's uh, actually in a what... fucked up sense a positive that everyone hasn't just instantly pulled all their money and cut esports and basically cleared the fucking lights off if even this was 10 worst... years ago yeah. that would have happened because think about it right in the current circumstances there's a lot of people who've invested a lot of money who if they really thought it would never be successful after this setback you just cut your losses now. You wouldn't keep investing during a fucking yeah. pandemic. So actually, to me, the fact that so few people are basically bailing out shows how legit it is now, as fucked as it sounds. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Yeah, but like, look at, for example, as well, what they're doing in lieu of sporting events. They're getting the players and they're making them play video games. Oh, it's surreal, content. isn't it? <laughs> 
So we've got NBA players that can't play in the NBA because of fucking COVID-19 playing games with their teams, with their real lineups, with their real teammates that are on those teams against each other and they're broadcasting it and it's getting good viewership. Mate, the raw surreal was fucking like Red Eye and Sadikist racing virtually yeah. against like real Formula One drivers. Against, like, really? yeah, against real racers and actually <laughs> yeah. beating them. I was like, well, is this some sort of, am I and like, am I, am I, is this, am I actually back at like eating and I just hit the blood like one second ago? Oh, so this crazy <laughs> fever dream there is. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it it is it is crazy, and this and and I'm telling you, this is why if we can hunker down and get through this tough time, esports comes out the other end now stronger than it's ever been before because we finally proved to these corporate fucks we have yes. something that they don't have. We can exist in a digital space, and people are interested when sports goes away. People will come and gravitate to eSport. It's as, it's as simple as that. And you can make some great content. And guess what? It's even cheaper than the fucking billions you pay on your sports package. And the viewership's pretty fucking good. Holy shit. What, what, you know, they're going to figure it out eventually. They didn't figure it out with eSports. But now that they're watching basketball players play virtual basketball and they're broadcasting it to a million people, they're going to fucking figure it the fuck out. So if we all get through COVID-19 over the next three months, we're going to be fine. Esports actually comes out on top. We'll have made new converts, all those thick-necked truckers who are in the ESPN comment section on Twitter going, video games, not a mass sports channel. You know, like they're going to be actually, they've, they've watched video games solidly for three months now because there is nothing else to watch. We just mind fucked them all. We won, like. We want. You know the crazy thing as well is when you say that actually, it makes me realize that if they actually did a good job with TV channels and like traditional um, vehicles for media, they actually would convert fans. And the reason I know that in a way that Americans won't is that you'll know this from growing up in the 80s, the 90s, when we had limited TV channels. And basically, when you would watch BBC Sport, I've always said this, Americans have a very different way of watching sports. They watch the sports specifically for their team or like their local college or alma mater or whatever, and they follow that. In Britain, when you had limited channels, you just watch whatever's on. So as a yeah. result, like, I remember when I was a kid, the sports that you're not even a fan of, like fucking balls or something, but if there's nothing else on for the next hour, you might Darts. give it a go. Yeah, you get Think about it. the inexplicable popularity of fucking darts <laughs> in the 80s. I remember literally staying up with my mother to watch Eric fucking Bristow. What am I doing? It's just a fat cunt throwing spikes and a bit of wood. It's mental. But like they would hype it up. There would be all these narratives like, and Bobby George in his first final. He's just a Golden fat drunk. Gold. He's a fat drunk. Yeah, isn't it? yeah just, he's just a fat drunk with a bunch of fake fucking gold chains on. What the fuck am I watching? I used to stay up and watch snooker. Fucking snooker, one of the slowest, quietest games. I'll still watch a bit of snooker now because it was bombarded in me in the 80s. Because like you said, if you wanted to watch something, they wouldn't even show you the programs they had scheduled because snooker and darts took fucking priority. And it took priority because you could put sponsors on there that you can't put on a fucking TV show or a drama or the yes. fucking news. News. You know, it, it was it was big money. Even shittier sports that the license payer would get would do better business than like some fucking you know downtown Abbey fucking type drama on at you know nine p.m. on BBC Two. And and so so yeah, I mean like this is what I mean when I say we won. Like we we we've, we've dealt with it for twenty years, and now finally we're actually making we're finally converting the boomers. Even the boomers are getting on board now. It, it, you know, it, it, it's done. It's a done deal. We have, we, are, we have now proven our superiority over mainstream sports in a time of global crisis. <laughs> and, and, and wait till this generation of sports stars start retiring and running their own esports orgs. Wait, yeah, that's wait, also, that, by that, the way, that's coming. Where, like one of the things where like the people in esports who've decided to take on the role of like what would have been like the SGW fucking scold in politics. Those people, right, are all going with this angle at the moment of like, don't you dare mention any success you're having or you celebrate the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It's like, that is such a nonsense angle because first oh, of all, God, as yeah. you mentioned, it is a brilliant thing that ESL Pro League is like breaking their records, etc. Of course it is. Why would that be a bad thing? In what way are they wanting? Like it's not some superstitious thing where them liking having record numbers makes the virus worse. Like they're dealing with circumstances that actually are fucking their company, by the way, and just taking the wins where they can get them. Of course. Why wouldn't you? 
Makes perfect mm. sense. Also, by the way, I'll just throw in again. That just shows you the people who have an agenda in how they're presenting information. Anyone who implies that me and Monty bragged about the viewership of the Flashpoint, go and find a tweet. You won't find a single one. Monty said people said he would fail if he left Overwatch or League of Legends. Yeah. I mean, what's that going to do with bragging? And all I did is say doing work and then showed a picture of the two streams side by side. ESL, by the way, have overtly bragged about it. They've, I mean, Carmack even literally said thanks to COVID-19. I mean, he meant in the context of they had to play online, but yeah, they've literally yeah, yeah. done what you guys have claimed we're doing. And I haven't heard a peep about them. And by the way, you shouldn't hear a peep about them. It's totally justified that they'd celebrate. Like what? In bad circumstances, you know how to make the best of it. Of course you are. No, and this is this is what I mean. Like those people are just so far fucking gone. As if anybody is like jumping for joy at the fact that we're all cooped up in a fucking quarantine because of some fucking global pandemic that originated in China, like some fucking horror movie, right? Like and every and and hundreds of well, I'm not going to say hundreds of thousands, but so far tens of thousands of people have died. And in and it's not just people that you haven't heard of and just some numbers on a page. You know, it's 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 the people in sports, people in music, you know, people people you know, people whose work you admire, uh, and it's gonna and it's gonna continue for at least the next month. Um, nobody's nobody's enjoying the situation right now, but the the British spirit certainly. I don't I can't speak much to Americans. I've certainly it's what I've found to be true in my time in America, especially in the South, is that you do have this attitude where you make the most of it. You know, like. When 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 the Saints won the fucking Super Bowl not that long after Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, did anybody fucking did anyone begrudge New Orleans fans fucking going absolutely nuts? No, of course not. When you go through trauma, it's the it's the razor light that fucking pull you out and make you realize things aren't so bad and aren't so bleak. So yeah, anybody celebrating record numbers for esports now isn't. We're not doing it because we're fucking being flippant about a fucking awful, an awful crisis. We're, we're, we're doing it because right now, couldn't we all use a bit of fucking positivity? Like, couldn't we all use a bit of positive news? And what's wrong? Right, I know we're pressed for time, so I want to quickly just talk about what Valve have done. Scrapping invites for the major, this was the announcement. They've also said teams will have to prove they are still in the form they were if they want to come back, and they're going to prove that form by having regional uh, major kind of leagues. So basically, you will you will earn ranking points, essentially, by playing within a region, and those ranking points will determine whether or not you're going to be invited to the major. So much like we alluded to when the first thing came out and the major was moved, we talked about it, I think, on the very... Um, uh, on, on the Flashpoint stream that it wasn't clear uh, whether or not they were going to cancel the invites. It's now all bets are essentially off. You're almost put in a position where this is, to broadly simplify it, re-qualify essentially for the major. So I definitely want to get your views on that. I mean, first of all, I've been against the old invite system. Yeah, I was going to say. Legends for basically since the beginning of the fucking system. And like, I th it's just another example of how Valve is always like very slow to change things. They just gradually do it. It's kind of the riot approach in that regard. You just don't ever admit you were wrong by gradually changing things. Because obviously the implication, if you change it drastically, would be, well, whatever you did before wasn't good enough. So I, I think it's long overdue we do this. I think the fact that it's taken this to actually wake them up to the idea that, like, obviously now it's a ridiculous example because it'll be something like 14 or 15 months after the last major that you'll be playing the next major. I'd say even six months after a major to be using results from the six months prior to seed or invite someone's ridiculous in itself. Like, you yeah. know what the way CS is? Three months can be the difference between a Vanguard being in the fall of a major and being dog shit. Like, it doesn't take long at all to rise and fall in CS. So my big concern is similar to when they brought in a similar system in Dota. It's just how it will be executed. Because my major fear is how they will choose the ranking points and how they will choose the system. Because mm. obviously that in itself is a way you could either exert undue influence on the community if you're an ESL in charge of it, or you could literally just make the tournament not as good by making it harder for certain areas to qualify or easier for certain areas to qualify. So I just hope they do it a reasonable way. Like the dream for me always, and I hope we one day get to this, is... We already have the qualifiers. It's called the fucking CS circuit. You just use the results of the CS circuit. 
if you do it right, you're already ever going to have a couple that are questionable, which is like if you've got 16 teams, who's the 16th team, right? Yeah, we can have a debate over yeah. that. But the point to me, and the reason why I find it so sad that it's taken this long to get anywhere close to it, is there's not even any debate over the top 10, is there? Like, you can easily invite the top 10 teams in the world, and worst case scenario, number three is going to be number six, and number four is going to be number five. Like, it's never going to be like number two's number 50, and you got it completely wrong. So I hope we can gradually move towards that type of a system, because obviously the issue here is it's very vague as to what they're actually going to do. Like, until you know the details of what they're actually going to do to execute this, it's hard to know if they're going to fuck it up. Or as a general trend, it sounds better. Mm. Yeah, and, and also as well, it's not just the major that's directly impacted. The minors uh, are impacted as well because it's essentially every, all the invites to the minor. Uh, the minors aren't happening now, essentially. It's basically it's, you scrubbed it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You do these regional major rankings um and these have it, it's a really good prize pool for the regional major competitions they're saying that out of the two series they're going to do two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars in prize money with the lowest share being 10 grand just for being in a regional qualifier so there's a lot of money going into this and then when you especially consider that it's double the prize uh, the major. This is the first time, I think, b based on the system and the amount of money that's going to go into it, where we're going to get a taste of that fucking Dota life. Yes. And I'm hoping this is actually part of a, a much broader commitment to Counter-Strike moving forward, because it's not even close right now, by the way. We, we, we did 1.2 million uh, peak players last week, uh, while Dota is still in the 600,000, 650,000 region now. Uh, and they set the peak of all time for a Valve game of 1.3 million peak players in March 2016. I've said it many times, Counter-Strike is now the flagship game for uh, Valve. And with Valorant coming out, and with all the streams that are going on right now for it, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this indicates because Valve didn't have to get the extra prize money. They could have just done it normally. No one would have, no one would have batted an eyelid. By the way, to, yeah. As a quick aside, can every yeah, person who thinks that they're making a meaningful point by going, yeah, but Richard, they uh, they have it. It's because they went free to play. Maybe look into what Dota Two and League of Legends are. You fucking mess. <laughs> they were free to play from day one. You morons. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, it, I, I've read some unbelievable, like Valorant. <laughs> Valorant is going to be the new idiot test for the next oh, month or so. Because people have been telling me that uh, the reason Counter-Strike has been having this growth is because people want to train for Valorant. That's a probably game the that mistake of all time, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is, isn't it? Uh, a game that, to all intents and purposes, doesn't look... I mean, if the, even if the gunplay is vaguely similar, playing Counter-Strike probably isn't going to make you a good Valorant player. Uh, it's going to give you some, some transferable skills, but maybe no more than any other aim-dependent FPS. So I, 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 I don't understand it, but apparently, yeah, the, even though we were growing for months before Valorant even had a release date and breaking records before then, the only reason we're breaking records is uh, Valorant's being released. Now, those people will think they're right when we see a little decline in... By the way, a shout out to whatever fucking out. Alistair Campbell level god tier spin doctor managed to take a fact that more people are playing Counter-Strike and, and spin about it, it, that that means that Probably actually... Right. They don't want to play Counter Strike. They secretly want to play a game that they have no possible way of proving they want to play. Like that's actually the most next level. Oh no, it's, it's unbelievable! Wow, that's pretty. Good. Uh, it's it's it's, un it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, it, it's 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 a good time. And like I say, I I, I welcome the competition. Um, I'll probably be playing Valorant. Riot actually reached out to me and have said that you know, hey, you can come into the beta and everything. So I'll probably be playing some Valorant and checking it out, and we'll write a review on the game. Um, but uh, and I'll be completely honest in my appraisal as always. Uh, but yeah, I think having a little bit of competition uh, will light a fire under Valve's ass. Hopefully, yeah, and good. we can. We, yeah. So um, yeah, I know everyone's saying what the fuck, like what world? Uh, literally, Riot reached out and said, "New staff, new game, new starts." Like we really welcome your opinion on it. They even wanted me to put 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 uh, them in touch with Duncan and stuff. So maybe Duncan will be. Uh, you know, like I've already said, when when it comes through, like Semler probably be involved, Moses probably be involved, Anders will probably be involved. Maybe we can all stream a game of fucking Valorant for the content. Like that'll be pretty fucking funny. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I do. You want these changes to the circuit to be permanent? I actually like the look of this way better than yeah. the major minor cycle.
I think what we had before, I've often said it, was almost like the worst possible qualification system you could think up. Like, I don't know any eSport that is bad a system. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've, I've even made the point over the years, people always miss this. Dude, even League of Legends made their system for qualifying better years and years ago at this point in yeah. time. So True. the idea in CSGO, we were still this far behind, was depressing. So any move towards what, in terms of the direction at least, is the right approach, make it more about what you did shortly before the major and in the run-up to it. And in this case, even make tournaments that directly help get you into the event. Because the stupidest mm. thing about the one before is... You weren't using qualifiers. Yeah, but you're just using the results from six months ago or nine months ago or a year ago, which obviously in CS don't mean much, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so f fingers crossed. They also did put out um, a statement today saying that uh, you need to get a proposal. If you want to run one of these regional major ranking tournaments, you must get your proposal in by April 10th. It's obviously uh, short notice. And as a result, certain TOs are going to be uh, effectively precluded from doing it, yeah. right? Because, you know, there's just not the log you don't have the lo logistical capability. But something like Flashpoint could certainly do the NA one and ESL could certainly do the EU one. So that would be an interesting little thing as well. People having different takes on the regional um, major ranking tournaments and, and everything else. So it's actually, it, it, it's got a potential that perhaps there can be some so, something gained there. Like we've lost a lot for the TOs, but having these regional major rankings, hopefully Valve kind of like spread out the regions as much as they can against all the TOs that are hurting financially right now in these uh, uncertain times. And I, I certainly hope that happens. It'd be cool to see. And of course, it would feed into that ongoing WCWWE fucking rivalry between Flashpoint and ESL that everyone seems so fucking jacked up on all of a sudden. Um, so look, we're not going to do uh, viewer questions today. Uh, so apologies to the patrons for that. If you are a, a $50 patron, for those who don't know, you do get uh, a chance to ask a question. We will double up for next time. It'll be a bumper episode. We're, we're thinking Monday or Tuesday. So you guys, uh, apologies for, for not asking questions today, but we will get you on the flip side. And I'm going to let Duncan get out of here because he's got something to do in a few minutes. So um, sorry to everyone that it was just a short episode today. I, hope, I think we covered all the big stories anyway. We'll have a nice long rambling tangent filled filler show for you uh early next week just before we get off i do want to say thank you to the sponsor again com. sam's gonna have to beep it all out they got a new deal going on that you can see up there um sam's put the new banners on and everything so you can click on that it'll take you through and uh, explain it uh, uh to you but if you do sign up make sure you use referral code rls so you continue to support the content we've had great growth on the channel in general especially during the flashpoint stuff you know two thousand people listening to me talk shit with a hangover um uh, it's, it's always very humbling and we're now at 86,000 followers here I'd like to get to 100,000 by the end of the year so if you're just dropping by because you click through on HLTV or whatever give us a follow, uh, jump in the discord as well exclamation point discord if you go there you can find out when we have to reschedule because mine and Duncan's lives are crazy right now in these quarantine times and the last people to thank, obviously the patrons that brought the show back from the dead that's our $100 patrons, Jerky's Mini and Alice the Alchemist, the Reykjavik on Steam and Madams, our $50 patrons Miss Alcoholic, Cathal, Flacksmith, J Dubs, Sunmade Raisins, Mike Feed Me, Tobias Bernasconi, Lipscomb Davis, Watch Doge, Car TC Owens, Jice, Colin Penny, Madsen, Benakagi Assassin, Sard Sawar, Marcus Kiyumpa, But Pounder 420, and Sigo. Thanks to all your generosity, and thanks to the generosity of everybody that tuned in today, subscribed, donated. We'll be around early next week. Until then, make sure you take care of yourselves, stay inside, wash your hands, and we'll catch you on the next episode of By the Numbers. Peace.